everyone. Today we're going to continue our discussion on chapter one, and we're going to dive into measurements and calculations. So measurements consist of two parts, a number and a unit or label, such as feet, pounds, or gallons. And measurement units are agreed upon by those making and using the measurements. So in the US, we have a slightly different way of measuring things. We use units like feet, pounds, ounces, etc. And in the rest of the world, or most of the rest of the world, uh, they use units in the metric system. So for instance, you might notice on uh, bottles at the store, such as this distilled white vinegar bottle, they'll list two different sets of units or measurements. So this bottle has 32 fluid ounces of vinegar, which is uh, equivalent to a quart, or you could also say that it contains 946 milliliters of vinegar. So the fluid ounces that is the US system, and then milliliters is the, uh, from the metric system. And then additionally, on this bottle of ginger ale, there is one liter of ginger ale, and that would be a part of the metric system. Or we could also say that there are 33.8 fluid ounces of ginger ale, and the fluid ounces would be a part of the US system of measurements. Um, and measurements are made using measuring devices such as rulers, uh, balances, and graduated cylinders. So we did see a balance in a previous video. Um, we haven't seen a graduated cylinder yet. So a graduated cylinder has a base and then a tall cylinder with graduation marks on it, and we can use a graduated cylinder to measure the volume of a liquid. Okay, so the metric system is used um, in science. Um, so that's kind of our standard set of units in chemistry and other areas of science. And a long time ago, scientists agreed to use the metric system because um, it's a really easy system to use, and that way there wouldn't be any confusion uh, going back and forth between, for instance, the U.S. system of units and the metric system. Now, the reason the metric system is so easy to use is that it is a decimal system in which larger and smaller units are related by factors of 10. And then down below, we have a table of base units in the metric system. So if you're measuring the length of something, then you would want to use units of meters. If you're measuring the volume of a liquid, for instance, you would want to use the unit of liters. If you're measuring the mass, you want to use units of grams. And then time, we use units of seconds. Temperature, we use units uh, called Celsius. And you might have seen that, you know, in Europe and other places in the world, they use Celsius, whereas we in the US use Fahrenheit. So in science, it was agreed that uh, we would be more consistent and use degrees Celsius or another unit called Kelvin. So we'll uh, talk about those units later. And then if you're measuring the amount of energy, let's say in a reaction, uh, we would use the unit of calories or a unit called the joule. And then if you're measuring the amount of a substance, we are going to use a unit called the mole. So you'll notice that next to each unit is a single or maybe a couple letters. Um, and these are the abbreviations. 
for each unit. Um, so early on, we'll be talking more about length, volume, mass, etc. And then later on in the quarter, we'll talk more about energy and uh, the amount of substance in moles. So all of the units we just discussed are basic or defined units, and we can use those basic units to calculate what are called derived units. So for example, let's say that we're measuring the area of a square. And let's say that each side of the square measures one meter in length. The area of that square will equal one meter times one meter, which would be one meter squared. So the meter squared unit is derived from this calculation. And there are examples of other derived units. Um, later on in chapter one, we'll talk about something called density and that has a derived unit as well. Now, prefixes are really important when we're discussing units. Um, prefixes can be used to relate basic and derived units, but additionally, prefixes can be used to change the magnitude of a measurement um, or a unit. So, for instance, we can have a large amount of something. So for instance, on a computer, there's typically a large amount of memory, such as a gigabyte of memory or a megabyte of memory. And mega is equal to one million of something. So for instance, if we have one million bytes of memory on a computer, instead of saying that we have one million bytes, we could just say that we have one megabyte. And that's a lot easier to write than one million bytes. Additionally, kilo is equal to a thousand. So let's say we measure a distance to be 1000 meters. Instead of writing out 1,000 meters, we could say we have one kilometer or kilometer. And then uh, below that are some prefixes for much smaller amounts. Um, so for instance, let's look at centi. Um, and let's say that we measure something to be one one hundredth of a meter, so point uh, zero one meters. That would also be equal to one centimeter. And then milli is equal to one one thousandth of whatever we're measuring. So let's say that we had measured one one thousandth of a meter, which is 0 0.001 meters, we could also write that as one millimeter. And the trend continues. And again, notice that all of these different prefixes are uh, based on factors of 10. So it's very easy to use versus the US system where, for instance, uh, there's 16 ounces in a pound, which you know is kind of hard to remember. So uh, in chemistry, we typically use these smaller prefixes, so centi, milli, micro, because we're usually measuring out very small amounts of chemicals. So we're not going to see mega and kilo quite as often, um, but I do expect you to know all of these prefixes. And I can post some flashcards on the website um, so online flashcards that will help you go through and memorize uh, these different prefixes. Okay, so let's talk about temperature because in chemistry, 
there are a lot of different measurements that depend on the temperature of the system. So there are three different uh, temperature scales that are commonly used. So in the US, we use Fahrenheit. But then uh, in science, we typically use Celsius and Kelvin. Now, part of the reason that uh, people prefer Celsius and Kelvin is the fact that there are exactly 100 degrees between the temperature at which water freezes and the temperature at which water boils. So you'll notice there are 100 Celsius degrees between those two points, and there are 100 Kelvins between those two points. But if we look at the Fahrenheit scale, there's 180 Fahrenheit degrees between those two points. So the Fahrenheit scale is a little bit difficult to use sometimes. Now, um, you'll also notice at the bottom, there's this point called absolute zero. So this is the lowest possible temperature that something could potentially exist at. So that point in Fahrenheit is negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, it's negative 273. And then in Kelvin, it's zero. So the Kelvin scale is actually really useful because all of the different temperature measurements are positive and we don't have any negative values there. So later on, uh, in certain calculations, we're going to use the Kelvin scale because we want everything to be positive. So now how do we convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius or between Celsius and Kelvin? So there are different uh, mathematical equations that we can use to convert between these different scales. So for these types of calculations, you will need a scientific calculator shown on the right. Or you can also use a graphing calculator, that's fine too, um, whatever you have handy. So let's talk about how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. So the first thing we need to do when we're calculating um, or converting between Fahrenheit and Celsius, we have to take into account the difference between the um, scales here. So going back, if we look at uh, the point where water freezes, in Fahrenheit, that's 32 degrees Celsius, or uh, Fahrenheit, excuse me, and in Celsius, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So there's a difference of 32 degrees there. So in order to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, we first have to subtract 32 from Fahrenheit. So that's shown here in parentheses. Now we also have to take into account that there are 180 degrees Fahrenheit between the point at which water freezes and the point at which water boils, and the fact that there are only 100 degrees Celsius between those same points. So if we take 100 and divide it by 180, so we're taking the ratio, we get a fraction of 5 ninths. And so that's shown as well in this equation. So we're taking into account uh, the difference in uh, freezing points technically, and then we're also taking into account the difference in the uh, number of degrees as well. Now, if we want to go the other way, so let's say we want to go from degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, we just rearrange this equation. So we would multiply degrees Celsius by the reciprocal of our fraction. So that would be 9 fifths times degrees Celsius 
And then we also need to take into account that difference in freezing point. So instead of subtracting 32 degrees, we're going to add 32 degrees. All right, now what about converting Kelvin to Celsius or vice versa? So if we want to uh, convert from Kelvin to Celsius, let's go back to our chart. You'll notice that um, the difference in freezing point is 273. So Celsius, water freezes at zero degrees, and in Kelvin, water freezes at 273. So we do need to take that into account. So Kelvin is 273 uh, degrees greater than Celsius. So we're just going to subtract 273 to get down to Celsius. And then we don't have to take into account the um, degrees here because both Celsius and Kelvin have 100 degrees between the point at which water boils and the point at which water freezes. So those are already related directly to each other. Now, uh, this is also really simple because if we want to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, Instead of subtracting 273, we're going to add 273 to our temperature. So let's do um, some practice problems here, and we'll see how all of these different equations work. So let's convert to 22 degrees Celsius and 54 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit and then to Kelvin. So we'll start with 22 degrees Celsius, and we'll convert that to Fahrenheit. So if we want to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, we're going to use this equation here. And all we have to do is plug in our temperature in the parentheses. So we'll put 22 in there for degrees Celsius. Okay, so now if we plug that into a calculator, we should end up with a value of 71.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if we want to convert 22 degrees Celsius to Kelvin, we're going to use this equation. And all we have to do again is plug in our value for degree Celsius and add 273. So that would give us a value of 295 Kelvin. Okay, so now I would like you to pause the video and try to convert 54 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit and then to Kelvin. And then when you're ready, you can restart the video and I will go over the uh, calculations. Okay, so I'm going to erase our work from before so that we can go over the second problem there. Okay, so Let's convert 54 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So again, we're just going to plug in 54 into the parentheses there. And when we plug that into our calculator, we should get a value of 129.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if we want to convert 54 degrees Celsius to Kelvin, we again just plug in 54 and add 273. So we should get a value of 327 Kelvin. Now, if you did not get the same answer, um, go back and double check how you entered your values into your calculator.
So um, for instance, you might want to put parentheses around the part that you're multiplying. So in our first calculation, you might want to put parentheses around 9 fifths times 54. You might also want to just put parentheses around 9 fifths. Calculators aren't actually that smart <laughs> sometimes. So if you don't tell it uh, which parts are separate from each other, it might assume you're multiplying when you're actually trying to divide. Um, so just double check. And uh, my one tip is to use as many parentheses as possible. OK. Now, you'll also notice that Kelvin doesn't have a degree symbol next to it. So that means that when we're describing temperature scales uh, with Kelvin, we don't actually say degrees Kelvin. Um, we just say Kelvin. So that's just a small uh, point there. OK, and then here's the answer slide if you do want to go back over these slides later on your own time and double check your work. And now for commonly used metric units. Um, so with length, we said that the uh, unit, the metric unit we should use is meters. But we also saw that there are prefixes we can use to change the scale of the unit. So for length, we often see things like meters, centimeters, millimeters, and kilometers. For volume, we often uh, see liters and milliliters in chemistry. And then we could also use cubic centimeters for uh, the volume of a solid. We often don't see cubic decimeters, though, uh, at least not in chemistry. And then for mass, we see typically units of grams and milligrams, at least in chemistry. Um, we don't often see units of kilograms because, again, in chemistry, we tend to use smaller units. And then we would